Good morning. I hope you rested well and are ready to worship with me and learn and study. I, in this lesson, I started thinking, you know, I always try to find a song or pray over a song that, that will encourage us to grow, give us that praise or go with the lesson. And so today's praise song um, is from a man who went through huge tragedy and from that tragedy, losing pretty much everything that he had, he was able to say, it is well with my soul. And we are entering a time where hopefully when we experience personal trials or collective trials, that we can say, it is well with my soul. So please join me in singing, it is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for uh, sending your Son and dying on the cross and then rising again, promising us the hope that we will spend eternity with you if we accept your Son. I pray, Lord, that during these um, perilous times that we will draw near to you and that today as we sit at your feet, we will learn how to be strong in our faith that uh, that we can we can throw all caution to the wind, put all of our eggs in one basket uh, when it comes to you, knowing that you have our best at all times. Thank you again for your many blessings in your precious and holy name. Amen. All right. So this lesson is heating up. The haters are going to be hating. And they're going to find ways to undermine the believers. And in this case, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
As difficult as it is to believe, there is not a no man's land in the spiritual arena. While you may choose to ignore and not believe that there's a spiritual battle, um, or you may just refuse to, uh, to stand, uh, does not mean that you get to opt out. I often hear pastors talk about Christians sitting on the bench and not getting into the game. They're like, you need to get up off the pew and then you need to be doing something about that. That people leave the church unchanged. And what this translates, if you're sitting on the bench, that you are allowing the enemy to run ruckshot over your life. He has convinced you that you have no place. Let somebody else fight the battle. He is beating you up as you are sitting on that bench because you are letting him do that. You are letting him bully you and lie to you because you're free. You don't have to take that anymore. That's like allowing a bully to physically bother you and you have the strength to beat them up and you don't do anything in the sense that you are ashamed, you don't want people to know, and you're going to accept it. That Jesus never said that we had to be complete doormats. He wants us to stand for the truth. No, we shouldn't go beating up people. I'm not even advocating for that. But we shouldn't be sitting on the bench. We have too much, we have too much work to be doing. We need to be sharing Christ. All humanity, whether or not they want to admit it, is engaged in spiritual warfare. The dislike and the hate that one sees towards the Jews in our story is what Christians also experience. Why? Because the enemy loathes God's children. He also loathes humanity. He is the accuser. Because you know what? When you're sitting on the bench and he knows it, and he's convinced you to, then he's going to turn around and accuse you for sitting on the bench. And he goes to the Father right now. He still has access to heaven. And he says, look at such and such. Why did you die for such and such? Because they're not doing anything, and you've told them to. He accuses you after he's encouraged you. He, he is that kind of um, being. He is the father of lies. He quest gets you to doubt. Did God really say? And he said that in the garden, but he says that in our own lives. And he lets it be in our own voices. And he lets us compromise. He is the deceiver and he will do anything and everything to create and keep a division between God and, and humanity and his children. We are created in his image in God's image and that's why when we read that he loves us we need to believe that even though we we have marred our, our bodies by through sin he loves us why because he sent his son to die for us and then rise again it wasn't just a temporary um, quick fix oh I'm gonna die and forgive your sins no, he wants to spend eternity. That is an amazingly relational God that he thinks that highly of us. Not, not in the sense that we need to be ego inflated, but he, that's how much he cares about us. He breathed life into us. He gave us souls. Out of all of the creation, he spoke all of creation but humanity. He formed, he touched us all the way, inside and out. He formed us and then breathed life into us. That is some amazing love. And so we come to the story and Nicodemus, uh, not Nicodemus, Nebuchadnezzar um, has deified himself and he has made this golden statue. Um, this is probably from the dream that he had in chapter two. And he is the, 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 the head was golden and he wants the whole thing to be golden. It's all about him. He is so proud and and just, and it's to the point that he dares any um, people to worship anyone but him and his gods. In some ways, this points to the Tower of Babel or Babel. Um, up to the point of time, civilization was united under one language. It was unified. It unified the people because once the, the division occurred, people had to um, 
only talked to, they only could work with the people that spoke their own language. That's why the, the tower never got finished. And now he has unified his country in worship. Um, because part of the assimilation was to learn the language. And here he is now going to unify through who they're going to worship, which is going to be him and his God. And three young men dare to defy him by refusing to worship his statue. And he knows, he knows about their God. It's evident because Daniel tells the king um, the dream and is able to interpret it. And he tells him it is through God, uh, Daniel's God, Yahweh, that Daniel is able to understand, um, know the dream, because Nebuchadnezzar was not going to tell his people or his men. They had to figure that, guess what my dream is. And by the way, if you don't guess right, and if you don't guess at all, you're going to die. And that that's that's this king. Nebuchadnezzar was not some nice guy that you, you know, he didn't care who he offended. He didn't care who he made mad. His word was law, period. End of discussion. And And so... He, while Daniel's God helped him with dreams, he probably would not be as powerful enough to defeat Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king of the golden era, the most powerful king during this time. And very cruel, very cruel. You know, just a little FYI, a little trivial pursuit, the Romans learned crucifixion from the Babylonians. When they talk about hanging people, not quite the way we think of the noose. They would have these long, like, pencil things, uh, sticks, or not sticks, but poles, that were sharpened at the top like you would a pencil, and you would be hung from the back of your neck. And you would be, that's that's how you died. Those are, those are your gallows. So they they would tie you to the tree, and there you were, and you just uh, what a terrible way to um, to die. And so so as with Daniel, we we see that he gives um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego the same short-lived grace. Daniel went to the king. He said, let me pray about this. Let me speak to my God. Give me a chance to find out what the dream is about. Um, I encourage you to read that story. It is in Daniel chapter 2. And and the fact that the king gave Daniel grace um, was amazing. And he also gives Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego the same grace. He's like, look, just in case you didn't understand, I'm going to let you, I'm going to play the music again. And I'm going to give you the opportunity to bow down and worship my statue. Can't be any clearer. Otherwise, you're going to die. And yet, this is their response to his rant. I mean, he's mad. And now, this is what they say, starting at verse um, 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need uh, to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. They weren't ugly about their response. They, they were resolved that they were not going to falter in what they have chosen to believe. They were not going to argue about their loyalty to him um, because uh, they knew that he knew that they were loyal subjects, that they were doing a good job. Um, but they weren't going to com compromise who they were going to worship and their loyalty to God. Uh, and... What is more important that, that uh, is is that the, there was the boldness to reply to a, a rant and demand. Why didn't they just grovel at his feet? I mean, I that would be really difficult to not 
want to just go, oh, okay, okay, you know, you know, I, this is my life. I want to, to save this. They, they were going to die if they did. They understood the furnace was there. It was, it was activated. It was going. There wasn't waiting to hopefully put some wood in, the, in this furnace. It was like a big kiln. They were expected to know that this was immediate. And uh, they, they, the reason why they didn't, they, 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 they were firm in their resolve, is because they knew who God was. They knew who they were worshiping. They knew what God had done for their people. Even when they had not personally seen him part the waters as, as their ancestors, ancestors walked through dry land from Egypt into um, the wilderness. They never saw the 10 plagues. They never ate manna in the wilderness. They never saw the fiery cloud that protected them or led them if they walked at night or the big cloud that also led them and protected. God was with them. And they yet, they fully trusted God that their God was powerful enough to save them from the fire. And this is that same boldness that they knew that Daniel had when he faced a nine-foot uh, foot, uh, Goliath, a giant. They knew that this was, this, this we know, that this is the same boldness that the disciples had when they stood in front of uh, the, the, in the temple and they were being accused and they said, stop preaching about this Jesus. And they said, we're not going to. We would rather obey God than man. And they got beat up. It, it says that they didn't kill him. They beat him up. But eventually, that kind of persecution happened. Polycarp was one of the uh, later, well, later early Christian church leaders, founders. And uh, he studied, uh, They history says that he studied uh, from St. John. And he was an amazing person. And in the end, he was told to renounce his faith. And he said, I'm not going to do that. And he was burned at the stake. They, 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 um, he cried out to Christ to forgive them. He had that boldness that he was not going to change. That, that's amazing. They also believed in God's sovereignty. They trusted him so very much with their lives that if they, if God chose for them to die physically in the fire, it was okay. How powerful is that? Um, that is some amazing faith. When you stop and think that, uh, well, tor death by torture it, pain just doesn't, <laughs> I do not like pain. And I'm going to tell you that when I get a little burned from the stove or something like that, that, that's not even, that, that doesn't even begin to touch. Um, the thoughts of being suffocated or drowning, which is also a form of suffocation, that does not, is not appealing. But yet they're saying, you know what, God, if you do not change the situation, I'm going to let my God make that decision. And by the way, it's okay if he make, doesn't make that decision. Um, that kind of faith does not happen overnight. It is something when a person has uh, resolved to be committed in their core beliefs. It is the trust that a young child has when they may be on a a high ledge or something like that and you reach out your arms and you say jump and they jump trusting that they know that they're going to be caught that's the same kind of faith that they had it was a, a it was deeply it's a deeply committed relationship and we only have that relationship when we act out um, what we believe we, we say you know what God's going to take care of these little things. See, they had already decided when it came to the food that they weren't going to compromise. And they said, well, we didn't compromise on the food. We're not going to compromise on, on this. Um, 
Again, those snitches hated Israel. They hated Israel. They hated his children. In fact, to be called a Jew during that time was a derogatory name. Usually, that meant that those people hated them, and they called them Jews. And that's where we get um, Jew from. Uh, and so, we see throughout Old Testament that Israel has been despised by many countries, many cultures. Satan has attempted so many times to wipe out um, Israel. How? First, by enticing them to sin, because he knows what God has said that they should and shouldn't do. He knows these things, and so if he can make God mad enough, God will wipe them out. And God had said, those that, that are in name only, Yes, they're going to be wiped out, but I'm going to keep a remnant. Nobody, my beloved, I made a promise, and I promised it to by my on my own name. And I never break my own word. And he has been faithful and true. He made a promise to beyond even before Ad, uh, not Adam and Eve, even before Abraham to Adam and Eve that there would be a redeemer. And so he has kept that uh, promise. And Satan. Satan despises that. And so he he seeks to destroy. And yet, as many people have tried to conquer Israel and his people, they still flourish. And they don't flourish in just little numbers. They flourish in great large numbers because God said, I will make your descendants, Abraham, larger. You can't even count them. The sin by stars in the heavens or by the grains of sand. That's how many, many children you will have. And he was also talking spiritually. We are the spiritual seed of Abraham. And so the only way that they we can have that kind of faith is by the saving hand of God. They were have been saved by the saving grace of God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lived the Shema that said, Hear, O Israel, you must love the Lord with your entire being, not just some. And they did. It was evident. They were willing to say, Oh, by the way, if God doesn't rescue us, we're not going to compromise ourselves. They were totally sold out to him. To Yahweh. They loved him so much that, that life did not exist be, without God. And, and Jesus said that the servant is not above the master and that the teacher, the servant, the, the student is not above the teacher and that the experiences that he went through, Jesus went through, would be experienced by his disciples. Not to fear those things that could destroy the body and the soul. And this is saying um, that when we're committed, there are going to be, the devil is going to go after us. And there's also this saying that says every person has a selling price, right? It just, just what's, what's the fee? There's all sorts of jokes about this. What is your fee? What is your sellout? But when it came to uh to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we find out that they're not going to sell out to save their own hides. They're going to make a witness, a stand, probably also to make a stand for their own people. Um, don't, don't compromise. Don't sell out. Jesus said, you know, uh, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose your soul? What does it gain when we compromise and, and we listen to, well, if you don't do this, thus and such, um, if you speak out, if you speak out about wrongdoings, you could lose your job. Yes, you could. You could lose your job for speaking out um, in, in bold faith. You pray about those things. If God has laid something on your heart, you need to be obedient to that. Do not sell out. Do not be silent. Jesus is coming back. 
there is going to be a period of time that that this world is going to see something that, and we are moving towards, and uh, something that's that's beyond us. And these horrible things that are happening are going to get worse. When we pray, well, come Lord Jesus, I want you to understand what that means. That means that we understand that right now there is nothing keeping Christ from returning or from calling his bride home. There's nothing. However, just as if the scene is if we were at a play and there was an intermission, usually during intermissions, that is a chance for <clears throat> the scenery to change. So those people that are working behind the scenes are going to bring up new props, new backgrounds, new everything. And right now, I believe that the scenery is getting ready to change, not for to that, so that all of a sudden Christ can come. It's changing for the need of an antichrist. The world needs somebody to save them. And in this is what we're experiencing. Christ said, you will experience birth pains. My return, this, this time is going to be birth pains. And as birth pains get closer and closer and closer, the signs of the times are going to get closer and closer and closer. The fact that I am able to use my cell phone and videotape this and know that there are people that can watch me right now across the world and satellites are being set up and such things are happening that that are setting that stage we are watching scriptures unfold as we are seeing the the scripture that says what is good is now bad and what is bad is now good what is wrong who are you sold out to is the question that is your takeaway the days of Noah are starting to happen. What are the days of Noah? Increased violence, wars, rioting, wickedness. Go back and read Genesis chapter 6. This is emphasized in verses 5 and 11. And yet when you read chapter 6 of Genesis, it says that Noah walked with God. He was active in his relationship. He talked and walked with God. How is your walk? Do you trust Christ enough to say, if the Lord chooses that I lose my job, that my family dies, or I die, is it going to be well with your soul? Do you trust him enough? Um, if you trust him enough to save your soul, that he died on the cross, he rose again, and he's coming back, shouldn't you be trusting him to bring you into eternity. We're talking about a relational God. He didn't just do that thousands of years ago only to wait for us to, to fumble around through this life and then, then be saved. He is, is saying, trust me in every aspect. Love me. Know that they're going to be difficult times. I'm not saying be rash. These men were not rash. They knew what God expected, and they did it out of love for him. It's not being pious. When you truly love, when you truly love, it's going to show. And, and Paul wrote that the smell of, of Christ and what he has done, to those that love Christ, it is a sweet-smelling perfume. For those that hate the cross and the symbol of the cross, it is the stench of the dead. So you're either going to draw people over because they see the passion that you have for Christ, because they hear life being spoken in your mouth, because you are saying godly things and you're acting on those godly things, or they, they hear all those godly things and it's like taking your fingers down a chalkboard and they cringe and it just drives them nuts. That's going to happen. The world does not like the Jesus thing. They'll tolerate the God thing, but the Jesus thing, they really, really don't like. 
because it makes it relational and it says it addresses sin. And you also have this these stories in the Bible. This is why we read the stories in the Bible. is so that we see God being relational and God being faithful, what he has done. We've never, I've never seen the parting of the Red Seas. I never saw the 10 plagues. I know my God is strong enough to do that kind of stuff. I know that he walks with me and talks with me and says that I am his own. And I got to trust him. And that's painful sometimes because I don't always see his hand moving. And maybe it's because I'm looking with my physical eyes and not looking with my spiritual eyes. He raised people in the Old Testament and the New Testament from the dead. He is willing and wanting to direct our paths. Yes, there are losses. There are losses. And I think that in America, we really struggle with this. People, as I said yesterday, you in China and, and in other countries, die for, the, for Christ willingly. No, or the, or there is there probably some pain, the thoughts that of, of a bullet going through them or, or uh, having being he beheaded or thrown into the fire. There, there, the, physically, I think that there could be some, but their resolve is so strong that they, are, they care more about what God is going to say. And in the end, that's what's going to happen. We all stand in front of God. They, they know that God's going to do something amazing. They trust that if he takes their lives through martyrdom, and there's a crown for that, by the way. Now, don't, don't, don't do that deliberately. But they trust that God is going to do something amazing if they are taken that way that it may draw more people because they stood up for their faith what if we truly stood up for our faith what if we truly stood up for the unborn or for the the aged what if we truly made an impact with our brothers and sisters in christ what would that do what would they do see the battle is already won Christ won that at the cross. Actually, he won it also at the resurrection. It, it, changed, it was a game life changer. And we are already, as I've said, we are, John saw people in heaven. That means that our future has not met up with our present. So we're already experiencing, if you're a believer, you're already experiencing heaven. There's no time in heaven. We're just waiting to get there. That is something exciting. That is something worth sharing. And I encourage you today to have the boldness of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We haven't, we haven't gotten to the next part, which is totally, you know, we're going to keep on adding more heat. Because we know that this boldness is not going to be re well received if if the king has already decreed what's going to happen and he's already given a chance and they're like, no, thank you. No, I'm not in the mood. That's not going to work for me. So be bold today in Christ. Allow life to come speak through you. Um, we are in 1 John 4, 1 through 2 in our memory verse. Beloved, believe not every spirit. But try the spirits whether they are of God. That means go to your scriptures. See if what you are hearing is truth. If you don't hear it, see it in the scriptures, it is a lie. Many false prophets are gone out into the world. And this is verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ. See, that's the key word. Jesus Christ is come into the flesh of God. See, prophets, if they truly love Christ, are truly going to, to teach truth. And they will only speak truth because Christ, now they may be, they may misinterpret something and that would be unintentional. 
but they're not going to teach prosperity gospel because prosperity gospel or crazy faith that uh, if, if, you know, if, if you are a believer, you should go into a room with a whole bunch of people that have Ebola or coronavirus or any other highly infectious disease or viruses and say, if you are a true believer, you won't get it. And if you get it, then you won't be a true believer. No, that is not how Christ works. And, and also, Jesus pointed out, you don't put God to the test. <laughs> you know, he was told to jump off the temple. And Jesus said, you don't do that. We do test him. But we aren't going to be crazy and do something like that. If God tells you to do that, and you really know, you really believe, then yes. But he's not. that's not how he usually tests our faith. So... They are going to be preaching Jesus saves. That's the message of the, of the Bible. Jesus has come to save us, to redeem us, to have a relationship. So I encourage you today, whatever trials you have, that you are walking with Christ, knowing that he is for your success. He is always for your success. He always provides an out. Cling to him during those difficult times. I'm having to do that. I don't have it all together. And and I'm going to tell you as I teach, I get hit hard because I'm teaching truth. So keep me in your prayers because I need prayers as I pray for you. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, it just sometimes seems discouraging when we feel that we we have our own feet to the fire. And yet we forget that you will be with us. You are with us. You are not some distant God just waiting for us to make mistakes. But you are a relational God that, that will be with us during those times. And that, that gives us the permission to be bold, to stand on what we believe um, is the word of God. And that is your truth. People may not like it, but, you, but that's okay. Help us to see that change our lives. May we make an impact um, on the world through you. In your blessed and holy name, amen. Have a great week, have a great day, and hopefully and pray to see you tomorrow. Bye.